The Old Man and the Sea, Part 5. Nothing happened. The fish just moved away slowly, and the old man could not raise him an inch. His line was strong and made for heavy fish, and he held it against his back until it was so taut the beads of water were jumping from it. Then it began to make a slow hissing sound in the water, and he still held it, bracing himself against the thwart and leaning back against the pole. The boat began to move slowly off toward the northwest. The fish moved steadily, and they traveled slowly on the calm water. The other boats were still in the water, but there was nothing to be done. I wish I had the boy, the old man said aloud. I'm being towed by a fish, and I'm the towing bit. I could make the line fast, but then he could break it. I must hold him all I can, and give him line when we must have it. Thank God he is traveling and not going down. What will I do if he decides to go down? I don't know. What I'll do if he sounds and dies, I don't know. But I'll do something. There are plenty of things I can do. He held the line against his back and watched it slant in the water and the skiff moving steadily to the northwest. This will kill him, the old man thought. He can't do this forever. But four hours later, the fish were still swimming steadily out to sea, towing the skiff, and the old man was still braced solidly with the line across his back. It was noon when I hooked him, he said, and I've never seen him. He had pushed his straw hat hard down on his head before he hooked the fish, and it was cutting his forehead. He was thirsty, too, and he got down on his knees and, being careful not to jerk on the line, moved as far into the bow as he could get and reached the water bottle with one hand. He opened it and drank a little. Then he rested against the bow. He rested sitting on the unstepped mast and sail and tried not to think, but only to endure. Then he looked behind him and saw that no land was visible. That makes no difference, he thought. I can always come in on the globe from Havana. There are two more hours before the sun sets, and maybe he will come up before that. If he doesn't, maybe he'll come up with the moon. If he does not do that, maybe he'll come up with the sunrise. I have no cramps, and I feel strong. It is he that has the hook in his mouth. But what a fish to pull like that. He must have his mouth shut tight on the wire. I wish I could see I wish I could see him only once to know what I have against me. The fish never changed his course nor his direction all that night, as far as the old man could tell from watching the stars. It was cold after the sun went down, and the old man's sweat dried cold on his back, and his arms, and his old legs. During the day, he had taken the sack that covered the bait box and spread it in the sun to dry. After the sun went down, he tied it around his neck so it hung down over his back, and he cautiously worked it down under the line that was across his shoulders now. The sack cushioned the line, and he had found a way of leaning forward against the bow so that he was almost comfortable. The position actually was only somewhat less intolerable, but he thought of it as almost comfortable. I can do nothing with him. I can do nothing with me, he thought, not as long as he keeps this up. Once he stood up and urinated over the side of the skiff and looked at the stars and checked his course. The line showed like a phosphorescent streak in the water straight out from his shoulders. They were moving more slowly now, and the glow of Havana was not so strong so that he knew the current must be carrying them to the eastward. If I lose the glare of Havana, we must be going more to the eastward, he thought. For if the fish's course held true, I must see it for many more hours. I wonder how the baseball came out in the Grand League today, he thought. It would be wonderful to do this with a radio. Then he thought, think of it always. Think of what you are doing. You must do nothing stupid. Then he said aloud, I wish I had the boy to help me and to see this. No one should be alone in their old age, he thought, but it is unavoidable. I must remember to eat the tuna before he spoils in order to keep strong. Remember, no matter how little you want to, 
but you must eat him in the morning. Remember, he said to himself. During the night, two porpoises came around the boat, and he could hear them rolling and blowing. He could tell the difference between the blowing noises the male made and the sighing blow of the female. They are good, he said. They play and make jokes and love one another. They are our brothers like the flying fish. Then he began to pity the great fish that he had hooked. It is wonderful and strange, and who knows how old he is, he thought. Never have I had such a strong fish, nor one who acted so strangely. Perhaps he is too wise to jump. He could ruin me by jumping or by a wild rush. But perhaps he has been hooked many times before, and he knows that this is how he should make his fight. He cannot know that it is only one man against him, nor that it is an old man. But what a great fish he is, and what he will bring in the market if the flesh is good. He took the bait like a male, and he pulls like a male, and his fight has no panic in it. I wonder if he has any plans, or if he is just as desperate as I am. He remembered the time he had hooked one of a pair of marlin. The male fish always let the female fish feed first, and the hooked fish, the female, made a wild, panic-stricken, despairing fight that soon exhausted her, and all the time the male had stayed with her, crossing the line and circling her on the surface. He had stayed so close that the old man was afraid he would cut the line with his tail, which was as sharp as a scythe, and almost that size and shape. When the old man had gaffed her and clubbed her, holding the rapier bill with his sandpaper edge and dubbing her across the top of her head until her color turned to a color almost like the backing of mirrors, and then, with the boy's aid, hoisted her aboard, the male fish had stayed by the side of the boat. Then, when the old man was clearing the lines and prepping the harpoon, the male fish jumped high into the air beside the boat to see where the female was, and then went down deep his lavender wings that were his pectoral fins spread wide and all his wide lavender stripes showing. He was beautiful, the old man remembered, and he had stayed. That was the saddest thing I ever saw with them, the old man thought. The boy was sad too, and we begged her pardon and butchered her promptly. I wish the boy was here, he said aloud, and settled himself against the round planks of the bow and felt the strength of the great fish through the line he held across his shoulders, moving steadily toward wherever he had chosen. When once, through my treachery, it had been necessary to him to make a choice, the old man thought. His choice had been to stay in the deep, dark water, far out beyond all snares and traps and treacheries. My choice was to go there to find him beyond all people, beyond all people in the world. Now we are joined together and have been since noon, and no one to help either one of us. Perhaps I should not have been a fisherman, he thought, but that was the thing that I was born for. I must surely remember to eat the tuna before it gets light. Sometime before daylight, something took one of the baits that was behind him. He heard the stick break and the line began to rush out over the gunwale of the skiff. In the darkness, he loosened his sheath knife and taking all the strain of the fish on his left shoulder, he leaned back and cut the line against the wood of the gunwale. Then he cut the other line closest to him, and, in the dark, made the loose ends of the reserve coils fast. He worked skillfully with the one hand and put his foot on the coils to hold him as he drew his knots tight. Now he had six reserve coils of line. There were two from each bait he had severed, and the two from the bait the fish had taken, and they were all connected. After it was light, he thought, I will work back to the 40 fathom bait and cut it away too and link up the reserve coils. I will have lost 200 fathoms of good Catlin Cardell and the hooks and leaders. That can be replaced. But who replaces this fish if I hook some fish and it cuts him off? I don't know what that fish was that took the bait just now. It could have been a marlin or a broadbill or a shark. I never felt him. I had to get rid of him fast. Aloud, he said. I wish I had the boy. But you haven't got the boy, he thought. You have only yourself. and You had better work back to the last line now, in the dark, not in the dark, and cut it away and hook up the two reserve coils. So he did it. 
It was difficult in the dark, and once the fish made a surge that pulled him down on his face and made a cut below his eye. The blood ran down his cheek a little way, but it coagulated and dried before it reached his chin, and he worked his way back to the bow and rested against the wood. He adjusted the sack and carefully worked the line so that it came across a new part of his shoulders, and, holding it anchored with his shoulders, he carefully felt the pull of the fish and then felt with his hand the progress of the skiff through the water. I wonder what he made that lurch for, he thought. The wire must have slipped on the great hill of his back. Certainly his back cannot feel as badly as mine does. But he cannot pull the skiff forever, no matter how great he is. Now, everything is cleared away that might make trouble, and I have a big reserve of line, all that a man can ask. Fish, he said softly aloud. I will stay with you till I'm dead. And I see we're starting to run a little long, so we're going to pause here and continue with this story in the next video. I hope you're enjoying the story of the old man in the sea. Please click like, subscribe to our channel, and leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you. As Tigger says, ta-ta for now. I love you guys. Bye-bye.